So, we all have a family story. It could be on a wall, it could be on a scrapbook, it could be locked away in a drawer. This picture of my father has been on the wall of my parents' house in North Carolina for over 50 years. Now, that's my dad, he's 10 years old, and he was the bat boy and mascot for a Navy fighter pilot uh, pre-flight baseball team. And of course, he's flanked by the famous Ted Williams and Johnny Pesky. Now, my father uh, became a professional ball player, but he had a, a twist of bad luck, had some injuries. And when he passed away, I wanted to honor the one thing that truly mattered to him, and it was baseball. Now, my father was the man with a Sports Illustrated in his back pocket at all times. There were box scores all over the house. He had his favorite players, and he was obviously had many stories just about the good old days, striking out Mickey Mantle, playing with Hank Aaron. But we really probably shouldn't, did not listen as we should have. So when he passed away, they looked at me and said, you're the quote writer in the family. Uh, you deliver the eulogy. So I started to write and I realized I did not know my dad's story. So I decided to honor him with this childhood story really about the highlight of his life in 1943. Now, I found evidence, uh, went down in the basement. It was a snowy, cold day in North Carolina. I found a metal trunk, uh, my dad's baseball scrapbooks from the 50s and the 60s, and there was this World War II scrapbook. My grandfather had gone to Annapolis, and he commanded a base in Chapel Hill, one of five Navy pre-flight bases. And my dad was the mascot as a kid, and these are some of the images. Uh, these are all major league players with the Navy publicist um, in the background, but it's John Sane, Buddy Hassett, Johnny Pesky, Ted Williams, and uh, Don Kepler, the baseball coach, who also taught survival. This is a magnificent picture. It's my father. He traveled with the team in North Carolina on the road in the bus. Uh, I will say the Cloudbusters, they played all the military teams in North Carolina. They played colleges. And this is a game against a textile team in, I believe, Concord, North Carolina. So Navy pre-flight, um, when Pearl Harbor was bombed and the Pacific Fleet was in ruin, uh, we went into emergency measures, as we all know, with FDR building the most powerful military force in the world. We got hurt pretty badly in the Pacific, so one of the answers, obviously, was to find fighter pilots, to make the aircraft, which GM did. They cranked those out, but they needed training facilities. And one thing they needed to do was make sure these guys were strong enough, they had perfect reflexes, and they had the, the mental and the, the mental fortitude to do the job, one of the toughest jobs in the service. So in 1942, uh, a somewhat nascent V-5 uh, training program, they dropped the entry age to 18. So what that did was it opened up the door for a lot of major league players, NFL football players, college basketball stars who wanted to become fighter pilots. Now, this is a picture from Emerson Field in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Publicity was a big part of this story, which is the key to writing the book. Now, this is a picture of my dad with the 1943 squad. I will tell you, um, I was a little horrified. I just saw this listed for $15,000 um, on eBay, and it was signed. I, I don't know who's selling it, but that's my dad on the cover with Ted Williams, Johnny Pesky, all of his childhood idols. Now... One of the reasons I was able to write this book was there was a living witness in Marshall, Michigan. His name was Ivan Flesser. When I started researching it after my father's service, because I, I told the story about Chapel Hill, most of the people from my little town in Hickory, North Carolina had never heard of Navy pre-flight. They had no idea there were so many major league players, uh, famous football players there. And I figured I would never find a witness. Well, I started Googling things, and Ivan has a slightly different last name spelling, and he came up at age 98 in Marshall, Michigan, and I thought, this can't be. I mean, Johnny Pesky was the last one to go 20 years ago. So I called the newspaper, and this is what I love about this part of the country. The nicest woman answered, and I said, well, hey, my name is Ann Keen, and I'm from Austin, Texas, and I'm looking for a gentleman by the name of Ivan, F-L-E-S. She went, oh, Ivan, everybody knows Ivan. He lives right down the street. Here's his phone number. <laughs> that is true. So I called him up, and we talked for about an hour, and he was a witness. He was the first pitcher on the baseball team. In great shape, alive and well, sharp as a tack. And I called my agent at the time, Jim Hornfisher, and I said, Jim, 
I, I found this guy, you know, he was the pitcher, and he said, you need to get on an airplane now. You, you have to do this. And I did it. I flew up to Grand Rapids, spent a day in Marshall, met so many lovely people. And I sat down right there in Ivan's living room. And the funny thing about him is he was a very humble man. Uh, he said he had never really told the story. His daughter didn't even know about him and his friendship with Ted Williams and the major leaguers who wore jerseys with the Red Sox, the Cardinals, every team. Uh, when he played for the Cloudbuster Nine, but we sat there and he just told a beautiful story, took me back to 1943 on the ball field, and this is what I've pieced together, and in addition to dear Ivan, who passed away a couple years ago, to his uh, memories. Now, when I told the story about Navy pre-flight at my father's funeral, I knew I had something big, and so I went to Chapel Hill to uh, Carolina, to Wilson Library, and I found thousands of images. And thank you to the Navy for being so detailed and precise, recording every part of Navy pre-flight. I was able to reconstruct this story. That's Fox Movie Tone Films there. And this is really important. Uh, my book has Ted Williams on the headline, who grew organically with the story. He was a legend, by all means, but one of the reasons this particular sliver of time in his life was not very well known, was because the Navy protected him against reporters who would write nasty things about him. And what they did was in Chapel Hill, they had a part of the campus, it would be like here at Hillsdale, they would partition part of it out, they had armed guards, nobody got in and out without a pass. But with reporters, they were handpicked, this is Grantland Rice, one of the kind reporters who agreed to tell a noble version of the pre-flight story and lay the hands off celebrity athletes like Ted Williams. Now, the reason pre-flight was created, as I said, was uh, we were hurting in the Pacific, they needed fighter pilots. It was a really dangerous job which required a lot of uh, physical stamina but also emotional stamina. You have had to work as a team player. So the Navy had to devise a plan, a really, really rigorous plan to get these guys in shape over a two, two and a half month period of time, mentally and physically, and to communicate. And the gentleman tasked for this job to create what this program would look like was uh, at the time Lieutenant Commander Tom Hamilton. He was a carrier pilot, he was a legendary football player at Annapolis, also the, the um, athletic director now. That is the book Cadillac Hotel here in Detroit. Detroit figures prominently into this story. So Tom Hamilton was asked by the Secretary of the Navy to sketch together what the syllabus might look like for a typical day. And he thought, you know, I'm gonna float this by the football players at the, at the National Football Conference. So this was a few weeks after Pearl Harbor and everybody was really revved up and ready to fight, especially the football coaches. So he was a very low-key guy, and he delivered the speech to put out feelers to see how coaches would feel about taking jobs. Would they take jobs to train the cadets? And the first, it, it, obviously we know it was a huge sensation. Everybody, they went into loud applause. They couldn't wait to, to sign up with a V5, especially pre-flight. And the first man up to the podium was Bear Bryant. That tells you something about the character of these men that lasted a lifetime. So, this is Chapel Hill, 1943. They had an airport on campus uh, about the size of, you know, a, a small municipal airport. Um, but these are the naval officers who swept in overnight. So you went from a sleepy little country town to just decorated naval officers, dignitaries, and so forth. Now, one of the reasons pre-flight um, to me, really resonated to me, it was like real living Captain Marvels. And my dad had spoken about these athletes that he saw. Because back in the 40s, little boys, they read comic books, they had trading cards. But at Navy pre-flight, there were literally dozens and dozens of professional athletes there. They were on Wheaties boxes, they were on trading cards, they had won World Series titles. So you name it, but they used primarily about 10 sports, and you can see this on one of the comic books about what they did day in, day out. So basically, it was a sports for war training program. Now, here's another uh, piece of naval publicity. They had a cartoon artist come and design this, and as you can see, the graduating cadet is flanked by guys training in sports uniforms. 
And thank you, um, General Mills. They were also symbols for um, just fitness and, and service to country. And there was an ad campaign where they said, are you pre-flight material? Do you have the right stuff? Now, one of the things that I think they teach so well on this campus is to step away from self, to embrace your faith, and just to be a team player. And this is Chapel Hill. It would be like right outside here at Hillsdale uh, where the guys are shipping into campus. And each pre-flight base, there were two in California, one in Georgia, one in Iowa, and one in Chapel Hill. They would ship in every couple weeks about 2,000 cadets at a time, and they would sign up. So everybody was on a level playing field. Now, this is what's so interesting. This is a major league catcher, and they split the, the ball players up. Because, you know, at any given time, they might have, you know, five, six, seven major league players, but they would split them up, and they would let them room with guys from Iowa, from Boston, you know, from Maine. They didn't know each other. They purposely put them in with um, train, cadets in training they didn't know. And they converted the campus into a military base. This is, I believe, this is Lewis Dorm. So overnight. Now, as I said, it was one of the most rigorous training programs in the world. This is the football field at Carolina. And you can look at the physiques on these guys. And they were in phenomenal physical shape, which was what it took to do the job. Now, as I said, this was a really dangerous program. A uh, few cadets died. Um, one broke his back. I mean, the, every day there were arms and legs broken because the sports that they played were rough. They didn't call fouls. They just beat each other up in the boxing ring. I mean, they really took heavy blows. But that's what it takes when you're going to be faced off the most evil, merciless enemies in the world. So they trained them. Uh, they were injured, but there were four ambulances parked on campus at all times. And they said one was always gone shuttling somebody with a broken arm or broken leg to the hospital. Now look at this one. I, they integrated European sports and even push ball. So they were really creative with their training. This was a typical day on campus. That's Don George, the world wrestling champion, and they're just showing, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's just what they did. So you can imagine if this was going on outside the walls of this, this building, just right in the middle of the quad. Now, of course I said, you know, these campuses attracted the, uh, the fabled athletes. And um, in Chapel Hill, these are five major league players. They're posing for one of the pictures for boxing. And what I came to learn was Ted was a champion boxer. He had a natural aptitude for boxing. But he's with John Sane, um, I believe Joe Coleman, Buddy Grimp, and Johnny Pesky. So you'll see them together many times in photographs. That's actually at the baseball field too. And here's another pose. And this had been in the archives for 75 years in Chapel Hill. I mean, what a gorgeous picture. Now, they would face off in boxing matches. And Ivan Flesser told me that they would really beat each other up. I mean, they, they didn't pull any punches. Um, and they would face friends off against friends. But it was all about defending America against the most evil enemies in the world. So this is a typical naval exhibition boxing match. And this is the, the gyro wheel or the German wheel. Uh, and this would be rolling through campus, you know, in the middle of the dorms, just a common sight. And I, I have a Fox movie toned film from 1943, which shows these rolling and shows them in training. Now, also to publicize uh, the things going on behind the walls of Navy pre-flight, they recruited Don Freeman, who was a famous children's book illustrator. And he painted these gorgeous scenes of cadets in training. And this is one of my favorites of an early version of the Dilbert Dunker. And they're teaching them to swim. So by the way, 75% of these guys could not swim. And they're going to be flying over the Pacific. They needed to learn how to swim. And here's another one. Uh, those are the dew drop, dew drop twins, I believe, from North Carolina, just filming uh, cargo nets and you know, training in the pools. Now, another big component of this program was outdoor survival training. Because obviously, if you crashed down in a jungle, you know, and, uh, anywhere, you had to be able to survive on your own for days and weeks at a time. So here's another familiar scene, and this is one of my favorites. There's some major league ball players in this picture uh, with the, the baseball coach. He was the survival guide instructor, and if you will see there, they have snakes, and apparently, snakes are excellent nutrition. So they would 
take these guys, drop them off 40 miles away from campus, and they'd say, hey, you got two days to get back. They didn't have Google Maps. They didn't have rations, and so they had to find their own food on the way back. But, you know, they look happy. It's, it's kind of like Boy Scout camp, but this is a very typical picture. Now, they also converted all the classrooms to training. So it wasn't just physical sports. It was academics, uh, naval recognition, um, physics, different types of math. I mean, and a lot of like also emotional morale building courses. So it was just many, it worked on every part of the mind and body. And I believe that's at the law school. Now, I love this part of the story. It kind of blew my mind. Now I have a daughter who's a junior in college. She's studying abroad in Barcelona, really proud of her. But back in the day, the Navy cadets had their own victory garden. They grew a lot of the food for the base, which is amazing. So they not only grew the food for the base, they shot their own turkey for Thanksgiving, went out in the woods, and they installed brick walls and drains and all types of things that are still at Carolina. People just don't know who did it, but the cadets did a lot of this work. And I had the pleasure of meeting a 102-year-old gentleman who actually was there. And um, I just met with him in Chapel Hill a couple months ago. And he said, do you see those, those sidewalks right there? I was here in college, and I remember seeing the cadets laying those sidewalks. 